always We ask the question, what is needed in the world? She is one of the leading diplomats in the world, from the Iranian nuclear deal to events in Egypt, and bringing Serbia and Kosovo together in 2013. Catherine Ashton, European Union's foreign policy chief, is traveling around the world, mediating in crises and advocating for Europe's interests on the international stage. Some say she is surprisingly effective. Others complain she personifies everything that's wrong with Europe. Not forceful enough, vague, and a waste of money, even questioning her salary, one of the highest in the EU. She rarely gives extended interviews, but now Catherine Ashton talks to Al Jazeera. Catherine Ashton, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Uh, let's begin with the diplomatic efforts to end the war in Syria. What are you hoping the talks at the end of this month in Switzerland will achieve? What are the objectives? I think Lakhda Brahimi, the UN Special Representative, has made it clear that he sees what we've called Geneva II as being building on Geneva I. In other words, to implement what was agreed when we met before. The most important thing is to try and find a way to stop the violence to stop the fighting. For so many millions of ordinary Syrians, life is intolerable. And we need to do everything we can to support his efforts to bring together different groups to try and get some ceasefires, to try and get humanitarian aid mm. into Syria, and to try and find a lasting and peaceful settlement. But as you know, Geneva one wasn't a great success. The, the problem is that the different parties in the, in the Syrian crisis have different expectations. From the point of view of the Syrian opposition, the objective is the removal of Bashar al-Assad and his family from power. From the point of view of the Syrian government, the objective is to stay in power. So uh, do you think that barring Bashar al-Assad from any future government in Syria should be a precondition as the opposition wants? Well, I think, again, if you look at what's happened at Geneva 1, it was very clear that this was about a process leading to transition. And transition means change. There's no question in the eyes of the European Union that uh, there needs to be a different person at the helm of this country, there needs to be a new government in place, and that the situation needs to go forward with that very much in mind. But, but the Syrian government isn't under much compulsion right now to agree to that transition, given that on the ground, they're making gains militarily, they're closing in on cities like Aleppo and so on. Why would they agree to a transition now when on the ground they seem to be winning? You know, the situation keeps changing on the ground every few weeks, and you've reported this very extensively. Things are very different. Mm. The situation is that the country is 70% ruined. There are many millions of people whose lives have been devastated. And we need to move to a point where the situation changes dramatically. And that means that the people who come together in Geneva need to come with that purpose in mind. And what Lakhda Brahimi is asking for is support, endorsement for his work from all of the countries and organizations who will be present, and then to be able to begin that process with all sides talking to each other. And I think and hope that the basis upon which people will come will be to try and start that process. It will be difficult. It, it is going to be difficult because, be difficult. as you know, Baroness Ashton, the Syrian opposition, there's fragmentation within the Syrian opposition, within the political opposition. There are divisions between the opposition in exile and those who are fighting on the ground. There is even infighting, as we've seen in recent weeks, uh, between the opposition groups on the ground in Syria. So you wonder if the decisions made on, on the occasion of, of Geneva too you know, can, can really work when those fighting on the ground are likely to ignore and contest these decisions? Is there really a point of having yet another peace conference on Syria when there's so many uh, competing uh, uh, narratives right now? I don't think we're at the stage of yet another peace conference. This will only be the second time that people have come together. And I think what's important, based on everything that you've just said about the challenge and complexity and difficulty on the ground, in the middle of all that, are lots and lots of ordinary people mm. who just want peace. They want security, they want safety for their children, they want life as we would recognize it, to have jobs and have the economy back and all of the things that will make their lives fulfilling and to support and help their families. Mm. And we have to focus on them. So however complicated, however much there are different views and ideas on the ground 
from opposition forces within the country and outside of the country. The purpose of getting people together is to try and say, look, regardless of all that, it's time to start this process. It's time that we actually saw the beginning of some kind of process that can lead to peace. And if we don't start, we'll never finish. Mm. So we have to go to our discussions in Switzerland with that purpose in mind, and we have to stick at it. Now, as you know, there's still a, a big question mark hovering over the presence of the Iranians in Switzerland at the end of this month. Uh, Iran, like Saudi Arabia, is a key regional player. The Americans still have reservations. What about the European Union? What's the position of the EU? Is Iran's presence helpful? We've said that it's for the United Nations to actually work out who they think needs to be at this particular event. They need to look at all of the competing interests, and Ban Ki-moon and Lakhdar Brahimi have to make a decision on who they think needs to be there for this occasion. And we will support them in the But, but the Americans, as I've said, have expressed Americans, reservations. Of course. But what about the European Union? The, this is we exactly just want, do you want Iran to be there? No, the European Union view is to support the United Nations in its decision about who should be there. We think that that's the most important element of this because this is an incredibly difficult job to try and find a way through this. It's incredibly difficult for a whole set of reasons, one of which is trying to work out who needs to be there for the start of this process. Now, the most important part of the process altogether will be not what happens on the day when I think it's 31 mm. countries and organizations gathered together. It will be what happens next. And in the course of developing a program for peace, Lakta Brahimi and his team are going to have to think about the engagement they have with a whole range of different people, with countries and so on, as he has been doing. So our view collectively is we will back the UN in getting this process moving. We will back them in the decisions that they take to try and see things go forward. And we will continue the massive support we've given, particularly on humanitarian aid. You know, as much as the EU was instrumental in negotiating the nuclear deal with Iran, it seems that when it comes to Syria, you're almost taking a step back. Here again, you're saying that you would wait for the UN to decide if Iran should be uh, invited to the Switzerland conference. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people feel like the real powers who are making an impact in on the Syria crisis is the Russia and uh, the, the United States. Where is the United Nations? What do you respond to those who say you're not as effective on Syria as you were on Iran? Well, look, the, the whole point about what's been happening from the perspective of trying to get the Syria conference together has been that this is a Security Council issue. And the Security Council has worked in trying to establish a format, worked with Ban Ki-moon, worked with Lakhdar Brahimi. Our job as 28 nations is to support that process. In any issue, there'll be those who have to take a particular leadership role. In this particular context, we're backing the leadership of the United Nations. We think that's where it should be. That doesn't mean that we are less interested. It doesn't mean we're less engaged. It means that we recognize that they need to be the ones who bring people together for all of the obvious reasons about the role the UN should play. Mm. On the Iranian nuclear uh, agreement, our first agreement, it's the Security Council that named me as the chief negotiator, and so our role is different in that context. Mm. There are competing and contrasting agendas within the European Union. The different approach between, on the one hand, France and the UK and the other member states. Take a look at the recent example, the Central African Republic. French troops are intervening alone in Africa for the second time in a year, first in Mali, now the Central African Republic. President Hollande even expressed frustration that the European Union didn't back France's intervention. Why has it taken so long for the European Union to decide whether or not to intervene in the Central African Republic, and will you intervene? Well, I had a good conversation with Francois Hollande at the European Council about this, where we debated these issues. I don't recognize the statements that, that you make. Certainly, in my discussions with him and with Laurent Fabius, the Foreign Minister of France, we have been working to support what France has been doing in the Central African Republic, as we did in Mali. The point is that when you're developing a European Union approach, it is in support of and backing what individual member states are doing in many cases. It's not instead of, mm. it's in addition to. And so on Monday at the Foreign Affairs Council, there will be a discussion on how we can support what France has been doing. Based will the EU be deploying a force to the Central we will African be, Republic? We will be discussing this and there will be a decision at the Foreign Affairs Council. 
based on a proposal which we have worked up with France and with the 27 other nations. Now, that's how we work, mm. because it's in support of initiatives that are taken but, by But getting States. consensus, it seems, is always very difficult within the EU. As you say, you're 28 nations, and getting consensus has always been difficult. How can the EU have a serious pretension to play uh, a major role in international politics when national governments don't seem to agree on key foreign policy issues? You know, I've been chairing the Foreign Affairs Council for over four years, and again, I don't recognize that. We debate but the reality every month. is different. No, 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 you're mixing up something very fundamental. <laughs> which is? Which is that you're talking only about when troops are deployed. There is not a central uh, worked out uh, way in which the European Union has troops of its own. It does not. Mm. There are 28 nations that have their own troops and who deploy. Sometimes they deploy individually or collectively in teams or groups and often they do so with then backup and support from the European Union. On foreign policy, the decisions that we take on many, many issues about how we approach our work in the world, those are done always collectively, always with consensus through the Foreign Affairs Council. And I think sometimes, because there's a lot more attention paid, perhaps understandably, when there are areas of conflict where member states get involved, that's where the focus lies, when actually that's not how the European Union works and when we do work together, as you'll see when we discuss the Central African Republic next week, we work together to try and give a collaborative approach to the issue. So just w will you be sending troops or not to the It CR? will be for the Foreign Affairs Council of which I am president to but make how is it decision looking? on Monday. It I'm not going to prejudge it because that's not how I work. Okay. We have the discussion, there's a proposal on the table which we've worked up and then we will decide. All right, I, I know you don't like to talk about yourself but I'm going to try. I know quiet diplomacy is your motto. Uh, you've been widely praised for clinching the historic deal to uh, limit Iran's nuclear ambitions, the interim deal. Uh, you've been praised for facilitating uh, reconciliation between Serbia and, and Kosovo. How does it feel? How, how does it feel to go from being described the diplomat the world ignores to Nobel Peace Prize contender? Oh, I think, you know, when you're building something new, which is what we were doing. This is the beginning of uh, the External Action Service, of trying to develop foreign policy and collaboration with the European Union member states in a new and different way. There are always going to be plenty of people to say, A, hey, that can't be done, or you're the wrong person to do it. Do you feel vindicated today with the I Iran deal? I feel that we've worked as a team and have got some results to show, but there's plenty more to do. Mm. On the Iran nuclear deal, do you trust Iran to fully implement this deal? Because the Iranian deputy foreign minister has said he didn't trust the West to live up to its commitment to lift the sanctions. Do, are, you, are you confident that Iran will follow through with what they agreed on? We've just agreed the technical uh, work because the translation of the political agreement into what does that mean in technical terms is the most important part. That's done. And that means that the International Atomic Energy Authority will be the body that actually monitors what's happening. That's the best way for us all to be confident that we're going mm. to make sure each other do what we say we're going to do. Because as you know, President Obama is having to fight a bill introduced in the US uh, Senate that would uh, impose f stiffer sanctions on Iran. And there are those who argue that the West needs the specter of more sanctions as a sort of uh, diplomatic insurance policy, if you will, just in case Iran were to renege on the promises it made. Do you agree with that assessment? I think where we are now is that we have a good first agreement. I want to move forward to translate the work that we've been doing into what I hope will be a comprehensive agreement. It's for President Obama to decide how best he works within his administration and with Congress. What I would say to everyone is that we need to make sure that everything that we do is in support of getting the best possible agreement. And sanctions wouldn't help? I think that the Iranians know full well. They're watching very carefully what's going on in the US and the views that many people have about how to go forward. Mm. For me, as a negotiator, I want us to get on with the next phase of this work. The, the White House has said that new sanctions would be, in effect, a march towards war, that those who want sanctions want a war. Do you agree with that assessment? 
I'm not getting involved in what the US White House spokespeople say to their, their own people. You know, the main thing is that because we've got a good first agreement, mm. because we've now got the technical work done, if this agreement, which will come into force next week, is working, we shouldn't lose the momentum. We shouldn't lose the moment or the opportunity to actually try and get a comprehensive agreement. Uh, Egypt has voted on a new constitution, uh, which will guarantee things like equality between men and women, but at the same time will give more power to the Egyptian military. Uh, in your opinion, is Egypt making a step forward or a step backwards towards democratization? Well, we're just looking at the results coming in, uh, in terms of both turnout and then, of course, the numbers of people who voted for the new constitution. We've been very clear, I've been very clear for a long time, that we need to see the roadmap being implemented, getting back to elections, uh, and getting back on to the democracy that in any study or survey people in Egypt have made clear they still want to see happen. That's what we've got to see in these next weeks. Mm. So I hope that, that that's what will come out of this uh, constitution uh, when we see the final results of the votes. Uh, we've got people who've been helping, observing on what's happening. The, right, uh, and I know you met with uh, Mohamed Morsi, you were the only in fact, a foreign diplomat who have met Mohamed Morsi while he was while he's being detained. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is now being designated as a terrorist organization. Should they be excluded from the democratic process? You know, we said to um, General Sisi and to all of the leadership, uh, President Mansour and others in Egypt, it's extremely important that the process that Egypt goes through is an inclusive one. Now, I differentiate in that between anyone who countenances violence and terrorism. But in the mainstream of Egyptian society, there are many, many people who hold very different views. Mm. It's one of the great joys of the rich tapestry of life there. Mm. It's so important that in enabling this real democracy to come into being, right. that but people are What we're are not seeing excluded. right now, unfortunately, is not that. I mean, press and media freedoms are being severely restricted in Egypt right now. Five of our very own journalists are being held, accused of be belonging to a terrorist cell. Do you agree that the Al Jazeera journalists should be released? We've actually been making demarches to point out that it's extremely important that journalists are allowed to do their job and that the journalists who are being detained should be released. Thank you. Uh, EU-Russia relations, Ukraine, uh, the uh, Ukrainian president's refusal to sign a political and cooperation agreement with the EU has somewhat strained relations uh, with Russia. There are many in Ukraine today who still want closer ties with Europe. Is a deal still on the table as, as far as you're concerned, or is the door shut now? No, the association agreement, as it's called, is there, ready to be signed. Uh, it's been negotiated over several years. It's ready to go. I spent a long time talking to President Yanukovych about his reasons for being nervous about signing this agreement. His concerns are about the short-term problems he faces in his economy. It is my view, and he knows it, that actually we can help with those short-term issues. We want him to have good relations with Russia, of course. Mm. They're a very strong and important neighbor and partner to Ukraine. But we don't think that uh, there's any reason it should stop him from signing it. What one of his complaints was that the EU wasn't offering enough financial assistance uh, to help Ukraine prepare for the economic reforms it would need to carry out as part of, of the deal. So would you be prepared to put more money on the table? Well, we talked through that with him because there are two or three different parts to it. First of all, you know, it's not just about competing with who's going to give more money. Mm. It's about what could the money be used for. And it's about the role of organizations like the IMF. It's about the role that individual countries would want to play in support of Ukraine. It's also the role of the markets because stability, as we all know, is more likely to lead to greater investment, greater opportunities for people to be able to develop their businesses and so on. So in every aspect of the issues he's concerned about, I think there are solutions that could be found. I don't think it's about saying, we'll give you this much or that much. Mm. Some people have said your job is impossible. What do you find to be the most challenging for you in your role as EU foreign policy chief? What, what are the biggest constraints that you face? I simply think that there's so much happening in our neighborhood where I think the European Union has to focus its attention and across the world that 
for anyone, and it's not a particular problem I have. I think anyone engaged in foreign policy, it's making sure that you can prioritize and do the things do that you think you have matter. too many hats i mean you're high representative of the european union for foreign affairs and security policy the vice president of the european commission is, isn't that too much how do you juggle all these different roles well you prioritize and i think that uh, one of the jobs in public life is always to make sure that you know what it is you think you ought to do mm. and to prioritize the things that you think will where you can be most effective now, you know, anti-EU sentiment is growing in Europe, and, and many of the, the parties, the Eurosceptic political parties, are on the rise in France and the UK. When your scope to act is so limited, when, you know, there is no common diplomatic policy uh, among the EU countries, there are many who wonder if the EU really needs a diplomatic service. I mean, how do you convince increasingly Eurosceptic Europeans of the relevance of your service? Well, I don't accept that we have limited scope to act, and I don't accept that we <laughs> have failure of, of consensus. Quite the opposite, that on many, many of the issues, and in fact, all of the things that I do, I operate because I have the backing and support of all member states to do so. But, I think it, but it's isn't, not is, isn't the service a costly and unnecessary duplication of national government's embassies? Because each country has their own embassy. Yeah, why, why do we need the diplomatic well, it, service? Because it doesn't do what member states do. That's the, the whole point, is that delegations for the European Union are engaged in issues where the 28 member states want to be active together. So the work of our heads of delegation across the world mm. are engaged in trade, where the European Union is, on behalf of all 28 member states, the uh, organisation that negotiates trade deals. It's looking at issues like climate change, development, where the development budgets mm. are put together by the 28 countries where they're delivered and distributed through the European but, Union. But this is also a time of austerity. Budgets are very tight, as you know. Uh, the diplomatic service spends a lot of money. Uh, it costs the European taxpayers a lot of money as well. You're yourself one of the highest paid diplomats in the world, one of the highest paid uh, female politicians in the world. Uh, do you understand that some people may find this a bit outrageous? Well, I find that the propaganda that you've just been repeating is, is always interested it to hear. That actually why, why, why do you think it's propaganda? Well, it's the reality, isn't it, that you're one of the highest paid diplomats in Europe? Well, it depends how you calculate what people are paid and what they have to pay for from that. Uh, and I don't argue about being well paid. What I would say is that 28 countries made the decision that they wanted, were possible, to become more cost effective by pooling resources and by being able to operate across the world as a European Union. And I think what we deliver, whether it's a trade deal that brings billions of euros into all of the member states of the European Union, whether it's by what we do and being able to tackle issues together that are faced by so many people across the world in terms of the development support, whether it's what we do together to tackle piracy off the coast of Somalia, whether it's the efforts that we make together to support the people of Egypt, whether it's what we're doing as the European Union to lead the negotiations with Iran, whether it's what we do to support the people of Serbia and Kosovo, those are cost-effective measures. All right. Your mandate ends in November 2014. What do you think is going to be your most important legacy? What well, do you want to be remembered for? Well, we've not got there yet, so we'll see. But... but we're getting there soon. We're getting you there. You don't want to run soon. again. You don't. You don't want to. You don't want to continue the job. No, I think it's time for somebody else to take over. Why? Because I think um, I've achieved what I set out to within my mandate. I think it's important that this role moves around the European Union. There are many, many people who can do an extremely good job, uh, and will do things sometimes the same, sometimes differently to the way that I have. But what I do you want to be remembered I for? Think what, what do you some want people to say about Catherine Ashton? I think the three issues that I said at the beginning that I would wish to focus on. First of all, the building of a service that wasn't in existence when I started. It now is. That we should be judged on the efforts we make in our own neighbourhood. And I think we have made some important inroads into supporting our neighbourhood. And the development of our relationships with our strategic partners, the United States is a good example of that, but also with organizations like the UN. So I think I will look back and say we've made significant progress. More to do. Thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank, Thank you. you for your time.